Is this based on parties so that Democrats and then Republicans will alternate in their time? Is that correct? We have no agreement for alternating. There's no agreement. So that those, because all I've heard in the last hour is those who are in support of the bill. Uh, my question would be, when can someone be heard who is not in support of the, the bill? The time was equally divided between majority and minority, not between proponents and opponents. I see. All right. There you go. Is that inquiry, was that by unanimous consent? It was. Well, that, I, that explains it then. The Senator from Florida. Thank you, Mr. President, and I appreciate this opportunity, and I'll be brief. Uh, my colleagues have already stated what this entails and how it, the details of it, and I don't think that's important. I got involved in this issue earlier this year after spending the better part of my first two years in the Senate thinking about this issue because, quite frankly, not just being from Florida, but living in South Florida, I'm surrounded by the reality of it every single day. When I started this effort, I, I became, became deeply convinced that this is something that needed to be fixed and needed to be dealt with. But from the very beginning, from the very early days of my involvement, I made clear that border security was an essential component of it. And I want to clarify why. This is not against anybody. Border security is not an anti-anyone effort. That's not what it is. We understand that America is a special country. It's so special that people want to come here from all over the world, and they do. A million people a year come here legally every single year. We also understand that it's so special and unique that some people are willing to risk their lives to come here illegally. And as compassionate people, we understand that reality, and our heart breaks at the stories of what people have to go through to come here. But we also understand that the United States of America is a sovereign country. And every single sovereign country on the planet, every single one, tries to or does control its borders and who comes into the country and who leaves. Every country in the world does that. And the United States of America should not be any different. And so that's what this issue at the end of the day is about, is that we have a sovereign right to protect our border. And we have a crisis on the southern border of the United States. For many different reasons, people have chosen to cross that border illegally, consistently, for the last 20 or 30 years, and the results are evident to all of us. So that is why border security is such an important part of this bill and of this measure. Now, when we introduced our bill, the bill said that basically the Department of Homeland Security would be given some money and that they would get to decide what the border security plan looked like. Many people in the public and many of our colleagues were unhappy with that proposal. They raised valid concerns that we were turning over border security and deciding what the plan would be to people that claim it's already secure. And so what this amendment does is it takes that back and it says that we instead, we here in the Senate, will decide what that plan, in after, that plan is after we get input from border agents and others about what will work. And what this amendment reflects is what we know will work. We know that adding border agents, doubling the size of the U.S. Border Patrol, that that will work. We know that completing the fence work, that that will work. We know that an entry-exit tracking system, since 40% of our illegal immigrants are those who overstay visas, we know that will work. We know that E-Verify will work. It's something that many of my colleagues in my party have asked for, for the better part of 10 years will work, because it takes away the magnet of employment. And we know that these new technologies that weren't available to us in 1986 or in 2006 or even five years ago, we know that will work. And what this bill says is you must do all of those things. And it is linked to legal permanent residence. In essence, someone who has violated our immigration laws cannot become a legal permanent resident in the United States until all five of those things happen. That's the guarantee that this will happen. Now let me close by saying I understand the frustration. I really do. I know that these promises have been made in the past. In a moment, the senator from Alabama, who, whose position on this is well stated, will point out that these promises were also made in 1986. By the way, in 1986, I was 15 years old, and I've got to tell you, immigration was the last thing on my mind at that time. But here's the reality of it. The choice is before us is to try to fix this or to leave it the way it is. And what we have today is a disaster of epic proportions. 10 or 11 million human beings living among us. We don't know who they are. They're working but not paying taxes. There are criminals among them. That has to be solved. A legal immigration system built on the 19th century? We need to fix this. And this is our chance to fix it. Thank you, Mr. President. The Senator from New York. We'll continue. 
Mr. President, uh, thank you. And first, I want to thank my colleagues uh, first, Tennessee for the good work they have done. My gang of four colleagues, my gang of eight colleagues, uh, gang, the seven of the gang of eight colleagues who are my colleagues. We are working real hard to get a bill done, and it is not easy. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done as a legislator. But we'll keep making progress and we'll keep improving, and today I think is a breakthrough day. Let me go over it. First, speaking on behalf of the Democratic members of our, my bipartisan group, let's say this. There's still some drafting of the legislative language to be completed. We're continuing to, to inform all our allies on our side about the contours of the proposal. But barring something unexpected, we're extremely enthusiastic that a bipartisan agreement is at hand. I know there have been a number of news reports this morning. It is accurate. We are on the verge of a huge breakthrough on border security. With this agreement, we believe we have the makings of a strong bipartisan final vote in favor of this immigration reform bill. From the beginning of the floor debate on this bill, we have known that there were a group of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle who were inclined to vote for immigration reform, but first wanted to see a strengthening of the bill's, the bill's border security section. That made sense, because most Americans will be fair and common sense towards the 11 million here in the shadows and future immigration if and only if they feel we won't have future flows of illegal immigration. We took those concerns seriously. Our bill is tough on this stuff. We wanted it tough. The amendment makes it tougher still. Last week, Senators Corker and Hoven emerged as leaders of the group of like-minded colleagues from the other side of the aisle seeking a tougher approach. My friends, Senator Graham and McCain, and I sat down with them. We began talking, along with Senator Menendez. We began meeting with them ourselves this week. For us on the Democratic side, it's been an important bottom line throughout this process that the path to citizenship not be put in jeopardy. The path is tough as it should be, but must always be fair. And so we could not go along with efforts, like in my colleague from Texas's bill, that would tie the path to citizenship to unachievable benchmarks for the border. Senator Cornyn's amendment, which was defeated today, went too far in that regard. And I wasn't sure whether the new nego no negotiations would produce agreement either. As recently as Tuesday night, Senator Hoven and I had an extended phone conversation that lasted 45 minutes. It would probably be best be described, Madam President, as spirited. But about 24 hours ago, we had a breakthrough. The idea that broke the logjam is the so-called border surge plan. The border surge is breathtaking in its size and scope. This deal will deploy an unprecedented number of boots on the ground and drones in the air. It would double the size of the Border Patrol from its current level to over 40,000. It will finish the job of completing the fence along the entire 700-mile stretch of the southwest border. And it will enumerate on a sector-by-sector -sector basis list of cutting-edge tools and equipment that will boost surveillance and apprehension efforts, including sensors, surveillance towers, and more unmanned drones. In other words, the border surge plan calls for a breathtaking show of force that will discourage future waves of illegal immigration. This compromise will inundate the southwest border with manpower and equipment. It not only calls for finishing a literal fence, it will create a virtual human fence of Border Patrol agents. Under the border surge, the Border Patrol will have the capacity to deploy an armed agent 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to stand guard every thousand feet, all the way from San Diego, California, to Brownsville, Texas. We came up with this idea of the border surge Wednesday morning after the CBO report was released. My colleague from Texas asked, why not a week ago? We didn't have the CBO report. We didn't know we had the dollars. We have them now, and we still keep to our goal of not costing the Treasury a nickel. The CBO report was a true game changer. It gave us the budgetary flexibility to consider massive new investments in border security that we didn't think we could previously afford. The surge shows the commitment to border security that our colleagues have been asking for. I was heartened 
to see that our friend, the junior senator from Illinois, has already announced that based on this agreement, he's support, prepared to support final passage of the bill. This is a significant development considering Senator Kirk initially opposed the motion to proceed. It is safe to say this agreement has the power to change minds in the Senate. Mr. Pre Madam President, this agreement on border security continues the spirit of bipartisan compromise that has marked this legislation from the beginning. And, in fact, in the forthcoming corker hoven Amendment, it will ha be a vehicle for accommodating some other compromises and other areas of Republican concern as well. With this agreement, we have now answered every criticism that has come forward about the immigration bill. First, critics expressed worry about the process. It was closed. There would be no amendments allowed. The bill was available for perusal weeks before we went to committee. The committee under Senator Leahy's leadership was an open process with 300 amendments filed. And now we're spending weeks on the floor here trying to move as many amendments as possible, and some on the other side have blocked that from happening as quickly as we would like, some on our side too. But we're moving through these amendments. The next criticism was that it would cost a fortune CBO debunked that one pretty well. This adds to the Treasury, cuts the deficit $900 billion over the next 20 years, $175 billion over the next 10 years. And finally, the last argument, we have to secure the border. That is vital before anyone could support the bill or some could support the bill. We have answered that resoundingly with the Hoven Corker Amendment. We have much more work to do, but I am now confident, more confident than ever before, that the Senate will pass a strong bipartisan immigration reform bill and that it will ultimately reach the desk of the President for signature. It's a great day for the cause of immigration reform and for the Senate. Thank you, Madam President, and I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Alabama. I would ask consent to be able to speak for up to 15 minutes. Any objection? Without objection. It's without objection. Madam President, I know Senator Schumer and the gang of eight have worked hard on this legislation. I respect their efforts and their goals. I share their goals and share much of the principles that they've stated. But what we've learned is that the legislation came nowhere close to fulfilling those goals. And that's why here in the middle of the debate, after the bill has been exposed, after it's been hammered for failure after failure after failure after failure, they come up with a bill that says, don't worry now, we're going to throw 20,000 agents at the border, and now you all got to vote for it because we fixed it. Now you've got what you wanted. But I, I would say to my colleagues, too often the phrase border security has been used to include all legal and illegal activities that, that occur. And what we know is not, a, not only do we have problems at the border, that we have 40 percent of the people who are illegally here today are visa overstays, and CBO's report that just came out indicates that's going to grow as I have predicted it would in the future because we're going to have twice as many people come to the country on visas. And they're coming to take jobs, jobs that Americans need to be prepared for to take. And we need to get them prepared if they're not prepared. And we need to get them off welfare and off dependency into self-sufficiency, making good wages, making wages that allow them to pay their health care and, and have a retirement plan and have enough left over to take care of their families. That's not been happening. Wages for average American workers has been declining since 1999. And, uh, and it's a serious problem. I thought perhaps or initially uh, with the Republican agenda that, uh, that this was a temporary thing. It, it might bounce back. But we've seen that sustained. And what the Congressional Budget Office score that Senator Schumer referred to, but he didn't refer to this, concluded was this bill will accelerate that decline. Wages will drop more than they would have if the bill didn't pass. 
and they found that unemployment would go up. And they found that although you would have some increase in the economy with millions of people coming per capita, per person, the GDP would decrease. So this, this is a, a, a real problem that we need to be honest about. How large a flow of people can we sustain and create jobs for? Do we want to invite good people to come to America to take jobs and then they not be here for them? Do we want to bring in so many people that wages for American workers decline, that wor Americans can't get the jobs, and that somebody comes from a very low, poor country willing to work at the lowest possible wage, won't that pull down the wages of, of Americans who were hoping to get a pay raise instead of a pay cut? So I submit to you this is a serious thing, and this is why the professor Borjas at Harvard has said it will impact adversely the wages of American workers, particularly American low-income workers. They will get the most adverse economic impact, and it's not been disputed so far as I can see. Now, the senator says that the bill is paid for, and you know what they do? They count the off-budget money. Let me tell you what happens. Under the score that the Congressional Budget Office gave to us, they found that it would increase the own budget, budget deficit by $14 billion. Increase the own budget debt of America by $14 billion over the period of 10 years. But they have a surplus, they say, over 10 years in the off-budget accounts, some $200 billion. And they've counted that up and said we've got a net surplus. Hallelujah. But what is the off-budget money, Madam President? What, what are we talking about for the off-budget money? That's your Social Security and Medicare money. And everybody that pays into Social Security and, and Medicare, when they get ready to retire, are going to draw that money out. It doesn't add to the net financial benefit of America if a person illegally here, now given a Social Security card, now uh, starts paying Social Security, but they're going to draw the Social Security. You can't count the off-budget money. And that's how this country has been going broke. We've been using that budget gimmick for way too long, and that's not correct. And we shouldn't be doing that, and it's not going to improve the deficit over 10 years. That's quite clear if you read the uh, testimony, uh, uh, the uh, statement of the Congressional Budget Office and their important uh, report. And, you know, it says some other things. In the Congressional Budget Office report, it says with regard to wages for American workers, if this bill passes, wages will go down. It says if this bill passes, that um, unemployment will go up. That's their analysis of it. Uh, and it has a chart, a chart in there showing that it goes over 10 years uh, or 20 years per capita GDP is below the, uh, what it would be if the bill had not passed. And that wages are going to be low for years to come. Why in the world would being a, we here as Americans uh, want to increase dramatically the legal flow of immigration above our current generous rate, doubling the guest worker program, in addition to legalizing the 11 million people that would be legalized under the legislation, and in addition to the 4.5 million that will be given speeded up allocation under chain migration system. So you'll have 4.5 million accelerated uh, on the chain migration as a result of limiting, un lifting the limits on those individuals and the people that are here illegally. And then in addition to that, you'll have a large flow of, of other workers. Now, I have an amendment. Uh, this is uh, a number of pages of it, some 30 pages, that's uh, very similar to what the House is working on today that deals with the visa overstay. It deals with people who get into the country illegally but don't go home, that don't cross the border. It's a growing percentage of the illegality that we see today 
and it will soon be over half of the illegality, and it certainly would if the legislation is passed. So does this legislation that Senator Schumer refers to fix that? Does this legislation that Senator Schumer says with the amendment, does it solve the complaints of the Immigration and Customs Enforcement agents? They have written us multiple times. They pleaded to be allowed to meet with the Gang of Eight, to be able to explain the realities of enforcement difficulties in America and why we're having an impossible time of making enforcement work and why this administration is blocking them from actually enforcing the law as they are sworn to do. And they voted no confidence in their supervisor, Mr. Morton. They filed a lawsuit against Secretary Napolitano, and they've asserted to her that, that she's blocking them through regulations and, and policies from enforcing the law they're sworn to enforce, and the matter's been in the court, and the court's considering this lawsuit. I've never heard of that. Federal agents suing because they're not allowed to enforce the law. That is going on in America today. And the ICE agents, they've written us a letter, and they said this will make it worse. They said it will endanger national security. And what about the other part of the uh, immigration process, the Citizenship and Immigration Service? This is a group of officers who have to review the amnesty applications, review applications from abroad, and do those kind of things. Well, uh, what do they say about it? They say the bill will make the situation worse. It will make it impossible for them to do their job. They do not have anything like the capacity to process the 11 million people that are going to be asking for amnesty, and it's not going to work. It will make the system worse. They haven't been listened to in this process either. Now, Senator Schumer says, and I hope everybody heard it, we got a plan, don't worry, we're going to throw 20,000 agents at the border, and now you can quit complaining, you complainers, and just be happy and vote for our bill. Well, then he said something like, well, we don't have it written yet. We don't have it written yet and we're working on it, and we're sharing it with our allies, and we haven't shown it to anybody else yet. But trust us, we got a bill that'll work. Well, that's what they said when the bill was originally filed. They said they had a sufficient fencing system at the border. And we read the bill, and there was no requirement in the bill to have a fencing, file, uh, build any fences at the border. It was totally up to the secretary. And... Uh, so now he seems quite happy not having been able to run that past the Senate, having been caught on that deal. He's now willing to uh, enhance uh, some fencing. But current law, a law we, law we passed a decade ago, required 700 miles of double-layered fencing, which would actually be very, very effective. This bill now, after having had the bill endangered, and they run up now and said, well, they'll do 700 miles of single-layered fencing, which is quite less secure, and not what we voted on in the Senate uh, 10 years ago with President Obama voting for it and Vice President Biden voting for it and, and uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton voting for it. That's never been done. We promised to do that, too. We passed a law, we even passed funding for it, and it never got built. Only 30 miles of the 700 miles of double-layered fences was ever built. So this is the problem we have with the American people. So Senator Schumer, I want to read this Corker Amendment. Who's writing it? Senator Corker, Senator Hoven, or you? You're telling us what's in it. You're saying you're still working on it. You're saying you're sharing it with your allies, but not with those who have doubts about it. I'd like to see this bill we've heard so much about. And will it deal with other issues? So we know this. We know the legislation gives amnesty first. We were told originally by the Gang of Eight we were going to have border security first, right? 
They finally had to acknowledge that wasn't so. It's was a pretty big promise. Border security first. Not so in the bill, not so in the Hoban Corker Amendment. The toughest enforcement ever. Clearly the bill was weaker than the 2007 bill. Members of the Gang of Eight have acknowledged that. Nowhere close. Current law requires on visas. Current law requires that um, under the visa policy of the United States that we have entry, exit, visas, biometric at land, sea, and airports. What does this bill say? This bill says, well, we'll have electronic entry, exit visas at air and seaports, but not at land ports. And if you don't have uh, the land ports in the mix, then you never know who came in the country if they left by land. And the 9-11 Commission says the system won't work. System won't work. They said the individual would have to pay back taxes. That's so ridiculous. That is not utterly unenforceable, just a talking point, has no reality whatsoever. They said you had to learn English. Not so. You have to have, you can be in a course of English six months before your time comes up. You don't have to have completed the course. Uh, that's all that requires. They say there are no welfare benefits, but there are benefits as scored by the Congressional Budget Office, the largest of which, I suppose, is earned income tax credit. And they said it would end illegal immigration. And the Congressional Budget Office report, amazingly, I would ask consent to have one additional minute. Without objection. Amazingly, the Congressional Budget Office said that the bill that's before us would only reduce illegal immigration by 25%. So we're going to give amnesty for the toughest bill ever and all of this, and the bill gets in trouble on the floor, and they scurry around and they get an amendment to throw, say, 20,000 agents are going to be uh, hired somewhere on the border in the future. We promise we're going to give amnesty first, though, and we promise that these will all be hired and the problem will be fixed. Well, they promised to build a fence. 2008, never happened. So, Madam President, we want to read this amendment. We want to evaluate it fairly. It seems to me it doesn't come close to touching all the issues necessary to have a lawful system of immigration that serves the national interest in a way that Americans can be proud of. We believe in immigration. We want to be compassionate and helpful to people who've been here a long time, but we have got to have a system we can count on in the future. I would yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Delaware. Thank you, Madam President. Yesterday we received some very positive news about the future potential impact of this bill that's being debated on the floor today from the Congressional Budget Office regarding the expected economic impact of this bill. And I think it's worth repeating. It's been discussed and debated, but I think it is worth repeating for the benefit of those who are watching and the benefit of those of us who are crafting a path forward here. The CBO report details how successful reforms to our immigration system called for in this bill will in fact boost our economy, not only in the next 10 years, but in the 10 years to follow. Specifically, it details how immigration reform will cut the deficit by nearly 200 billion, I think it's 197 billion, over the next decade, and then 700 billion in the following decade. CBO projects over 20 years, nearly a trillion dollars in savings. Now, while economic growth and deficit reduction are both great things, important for our country. What is particularly interesting and valuable about this bill is that the growth and jobs, according to CBO, will be experienced by Americans all across the country and all along the labor spectrum. The CBO report is consistent with a statement last month from the Social Security Administration that this bill would create over three million jobs in the next 10 years. Simply put, Madam President, this is a jobs bill. The immigration bill before us creates jobs in a number of different ways that I think are worth taking a minute and looking at. First, the bill creates jobs by making needed investments, as you've heard at great length today, in border security. The brave men and women who defend our country's borders will get the support they need to reduce illegal immigration and save lives. Many of these men and women, in fact, will have served honorably previously in our armed forces abroad, and this bill provides a specific opportunity at which our heroes will excel. 
It also creates jobs by creating and enhancing immigration programs that encourage investment in American companies and in American workers. The permanent authorization of such demonstrated programs such as EB-5 and the new Invest Visa, which build upon years of demonstrated success in creating American jobs through targeted investment of foreign capital, I think is another benefit of this bill. In the last Congress, I worked with a bipartisan group, Senator Warner, Senator Rubio, Senator Moran, in crafting something called the Startup Visa. And I'm thrilled that this includes the Invest Visa, quite similar to the Startup Visa idea, that encourages foreign nationals with capital who are entrepreneurs to come to the United States and invest in job growth in our country. New companies create new jobs, and the contributions of immigrant entrepreneurs are well known in every corner of this country, including my own home state of Delaware. By encouraging rather than limiting immigrant entrepreneurs, this bill will ensure the American dream remains alive and well for future generations. This bill also, in my view, will create jobs in the short term and the long term by encouraging companies to invest and grow here in the United States rather than abroad. It balances the need to attract and retain high-skilled foreign-born individuals, many of whom are currently trained at American universities at public expense, while also ensuring that companies recruit Americans for open positions in high-skilled jobs, typically those that focus in the engineering and science and math and technology areas. The reforms in this bill to our employment-based visa system are long overdue. It does a wide range of things. It clears backlogs and eliminates the per-country caps. It permits so-called dual intent for students. All of these, I think, are positive for improving the quality and the employability of the American workforce. I think we should get this done. At the same time, the bill makes an important contribution to the health and welfare of American workers. By cracking down on unauthorized, illegal employment and bringing workers out of the shadows and into our open economy. I'm particularly happy this bill includes clear guidance that immigrants authorized to work in this country are able to provide services in all parts of the economy by accessing appropriate licensure standards. This provision will ensure that once legally authorized to work, immigrants who abide by the same laws and safety measures as Americans will be able to bring their full skills and talents into our economy. For the long-term health of our economy, this bill also contains an important investment in training in our children. I had the pleasure of working with Senators Hatch, Rubio, and Klobuchar on a STEM fund concept in our Immigration Innovation Bill, and I'm glad to see the inclusion of that STEM education fund that will improve the science, technology, engineering, and math education of U.S. national children in schools across this country. At a time when we have to make difficult decisions, about how best to cut the deficit and grow the economy, this bill is perhaps the best chance we've got at making significant bipartisan progress while also making our country more fair, more just, and more secure. If I might, for another few minutes, Madam President, I'd like to also talk about what it means to make our immigration system more just. America has earned its place in the world in part because of the immigrants that have come before us, bringing their culture, their passion, their ideas and their skills to our shores. And when I ask Americans what they expect of our immigration system as we try to fix this badly broken system, they say they want one that keeps us safe from foreign threats, from terrorism and dangerous individuals. They want a system that protects the American workforce and that grows our economy. And they want a system that's fair and transparent and that reflects our most basic values. It's clear to me, as it is, I suspect, to you, Madam President, and many of our colleagues, that our current immigration system just isn't consistent with our most sacred values. We are failing to resolve legal disputes through a judicial process worthy of our world-renowned justice system. And we are failing to safeguard taxpayer dollars, which we are needlessly wasting with a slow and inefficient, poorly managed immigration legal system. Our immigration system jeopardizes our values and mistreats those who would adopt them as their own. So I think we must act. Fortunately, this bill before us today better aligns our immigration system with our most basic values. It's not perfect, but it is a vital and needed step forward. It makes critical progress, for example, in the treatment of children who are forced into our immigration courts. Under our current system, children as young as eight years old, often with limited English language skills, are forced to stand in front of immigration judges and argue whether they have some basis to remain in our country. These children aren't represented by counsel. The proceeding is adversarial. The judge is an employee of the same agency as the prosecutor. And this, in my view, doesn't look anything like America. 
and in some essential ways, it must change. By expanding access to representation for children, this bill will not only seek better justice for immigrant children, but also help administer cases in a more efficient manner. And in our immigration courts, where immigrants are regularly brought before judges without information central to their own cases, this bill will ensure immigrants have access to their own case files before they appear in court. In our own civil and criminal court systems, this sort of basic information exchange is the bare minimum. This is an improvement that reflects our values by letting people understand the consequences before them when they step into a courtroom. It's also a common sense way to save money by expediting immigration proceedings where dockets are currently backlogged not just weeks and months, but years. And while immigration courts deal with mounting backlogs, many immigrants remain in detention at enormous cost to taxpayers. Finally, this bill also proposes a rational detention policy that keeps immigrants who pose a real threat to society in detention while recognizing the value, the capability of modern technology to provide alternatives to detention when the only concern is appearing for a hearing. Our values tell us that individuals who pose no threat to society don't belong in protracted detention. And technology has allowed us to exercise better alternatives. By addressing the backlog of cases through improvements to the court system and by making steps towards a more rational detention policy, I believe this bill in its current form will save money while reflecting our shared values. I do want to draw my colleagues' attention to one amendment that raises concerns for me on this exact point. It's number 1203, and Senator Inhofe is the lead sponsor. It would, in my view, require essentially mandatory indefinite detention of those who are currently detained in the American immigration system for which we can find no country that would accept them, but with no pathway, no alternative, no discretion for an immigration judge to choose to use technology to allow them out of detention while ensuring that they pose no threat to security for our communities. I think this takes away necessary detention, um, uh, necessary opportunities for immigration judges to exercise discretion as to who belongs in detention for very long periods of time at great public expense. It is my hope my colleagues will act to defeat this amendment. In closing, Madam President, in my view, it's critical for the future of our country. We address all these issues now, and I look forward to the passage of this legislation. When our laws are so inconsistent with our basic values, we should act without delay. And when we have right in front of us an opportunity to reduce the deficit and to grow jobs, to make this country safer, stronger, fairer, and more prosperous, we should act in a bipartisan and progressive way. With that, thank you, and I yield the floor. And suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. We've been hearing debate on a deal between Senators Hoven and Corker on an amendment that they plan to introduce that would increase the number of border agents by 20,000 and call for more spending on drones, helicopters, and cameras on the border. Congressional Quarterly writes that the amendment would also set a goal for border officials to either capture or turn back 90% of the people they spot trying to cross the border. Earlier versions of the proposal had, been, had made the apprehension rate a firm requirement that needed to be met for at least one year before undocumented immigrants could apply for a legal permanent residence. So as the Senate continues to debate immigration, the House this afternoon failed to pass the Farm Bill. The Hill writes, in a blow to House GOP leaders, members voted down the $940 billion bill in a 195 to 234 vote that only won 24 Democratic votes. Most Democrats voted against the bill because it cut food stamp programs by more than $20 billion. And many Republicans also voted no, but for a different reason. They said it was too expensive a bill to pass when the country has $17 trillion in debt. 
here are a few tweets from reporters who've been watching that story. Luke Russert of NBC tweets, Whip McCarthy's team says that Pelosi killed the farm bill, only delivering half of the vote she promised. And then Fox News of Chad Program tweets, Whip McCarthy says D's turned on Peterson farm bill. And then the last tweet was from uh, John Bresnahan of Politico saying that House GOP leadership are blaming Democrats for loss on the farm bill, but it's been clear for days Dems were going to vote against it. That's what happened in the House this afternoon. Madam President. Senator from Louisiana. Madam President, I understand that the uh, Republican side is out of time, so I would ask unanimous consent to be recognized for one minute. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. And at that point, I would ask for regular order on the Leahy Amendment. The, the Senate is in quorum call. I would ask unanimous consent to vitiate the quorum call. Without objection. And I would ask to go to regular order to the Leahy Amendment. Without objection. The amendment is pending. Great, Madam President. At this point, I would send a second degree amendment to the desk to make that pending. The clerk will report. The senator from Louisiana, Mr. Vitter, proposes an amendment 
This is numbered 1507 to amendment number 1183. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Here's how the Associated Press is writing about the immigration bill pending in the Senate today. The White House-backed immigration legislation gained momentum as lawmakers closed in on a bipartisan compromise to spend tens of billions of dollars stiffening border security without delaying legalization for millions living in the country unlawfully. And we've heard some senators talking on the floor about what lawmakers are calling the border surge amendment. Also wanted to recap what happened on the other side of the Capitol. The House this afternoon failed to pass the farm bill. The vote was 195 to 234. 24 Democrats voted in favor and 62 Republicans opposed the bill.
Madam President. Senator from Utah. 